Now, before we start, um, I'd like to say uh, that uh, um, Shehin, uh, the previous speaker, uh, has been writing for our uh, journal of uh, uh, proof of concept, or the, or the other thing. Uh, the um, uh, copies of that were distributed last year at HTHC. Uh, you can find them online. And Shehin writes a um, series of articles on system boot. And uh, if you want to understand uh, the earliest stages of system boot, uh, these are uh, the articles for you to read. So look for uh, the previous two copies of uh, PSU GTFO online uh, and read Shehin's articles. They are uh, very uh, concise and yet very informative in how things work uh, at the earliest stages of the boot. Yeah, um, partying has been great, except my voice is gone. <laughs> so the thing about um, the thing about uh, 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 the sort of parties that we have here uh, is that uh, it's quite impossible to keep the voice by the second day. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. Um, uh, let's start. This uh, talk uh, is about uh, old bugs, well, uh, bugs uh, from the last two years. And those bugs have been really, really simple. And in each case, uh, the actual uh, missing thing uh, that uh, turned uh, a bug into a famous bug uh, was a simple oversight. So hence uh, the title of this talk. Yeah, hence the title of this talk. You know, it's a children's poem. Uh, for want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. And for want of a horse, the rider was lost. And for loss of the rider, the battle was lost. Then the kingdom, um, and it sort of goes from there. So a small thing uh, that propagates cas cascadingly uh, and uh, creates this uh, enormous failure in the end. Uh, you can sort of write it down uh, in a formal way. Um, uh, you know, no nail, no horseshoe, no horse. Uh, but very often, when a simple mistake is made, uh, something is gained, right? And that thing is usually a pony when we're talking about bugs. So that's how bugs get, pay get famous. Um, and we're going to talk about those famous bugs in 2013 and 2014. And the thing about them is that they were all simple and avoidable. So, you know, uh, just exactly that case when uh, you should have uh, uh, shooed your horse right. And, uh, of course, what we want to do is eliminate those classes of bugs. And so every time uh, we see that sort of thing, uh, we ask ourselves, we should be asking ourselves, what went wrong and why it went wrong. And when a certain kind of a mistake gets made uh, all the time and by people dedicated to what they're doing, um, well, maybe there is some bigger principle at work. Maybe uh, there is, uh, um, uh, this is time to step back and see if we are actually thinking about the topic right. Maybe uh, we don't have the right model for uh, uh, parsing, for input processing, for validation. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. And so you could say uh, hindsight is 2020. Of course, once the bug has been discovered, it looks simple. Uh, to which I would counter. Uh, there is another thing that we know as hindsight, and this is uh, work safety rules. Uh, simple rules like don't check for voltage with your bare hand, uh, right? Uh, there's a saying in Russian that workplace safety rules are written in blood because behind uh, each and every simple rule uh, there is a gruesome uh, accident. Well, uh, such simple rules, I argue, are long overdue in software 
because in software, it's usually actually not even the developer who suffers, it's the uh, end customer whom this industry calls the user. And as uh, Felix Lindner, FX, says, there are only two industries that call their customers users. That's the drug industry and the software industry. Uh, interestingly, neither has liability. And so there are all sorts of uh, simple rules, like don't stack your uh, uh, bricks too high. Uh, these are, by the way, uh, Russian posters, and they were very graphic. And possibly this was, uh, this was because uh, people who were supposed to read them and profit from them did not all know how to read. So uh, that, uh, that is an interesting culture, right? So, you know, don't stack your bricks too high. Don't stand under uh, towers where people work. Uh, don't uh, uh, dig yourself uh, under uh, 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 loads that can fall on you, and things like that. So, uh, we have a similar situation in software engineering. There is a persistent anti-pattern. Uh, that keeps uh, getting us. And we talked about those um, uh, anti-patterns in uh, 2012 at our Brooklyn talk, the video is online, we called this shotgun parsers because uh, the anti-pattern is that the checks for input uh, data, the checks for validity of input data are scattered ad hoc just like a shotgun uh, uh, pattern of pellets goes all over the place, and uh, you you don't actually aim a shotgun; you just point it, as they say uh, in um, that business. So uh, scattering the random validity checks through your parser is not going to protect you. Uh, you have to do better than that, especially because in the parser you can actually, uh, you, you actually need to malloc, mem copy, do arithmetic, and all the other juicy things that the attacker just loves you uh, to do, because uh, that leads to memory corruption, uh, overwrites, uh, and that sort of thing. And it is worse when the protocol syntax is complex and what we call context sensitive. So, uh, there are famous examples of people who cared, well, bind, uh, 8.4 uh, was our first example. Open SSH uh, 3.3 uh, pre-authentication vulnerability, uh, pretty damn bad, right? Um, uh, Pre-auth remote code execution, exploited by Goebbels in 2002. Then Open BSD, again, people who care about security, uh, people who took pains to write their code securely. Uh, nevertheless, the 4.0 version in 2007 uh, was vulnerable to an ICMPv6 fragmentation attack uh, and uh, was uh, remotely exploited by uh, core security. So, and those were pretty uh, complex bugs, right? Uh, also made the ponies at, at, at some point. So those were pretty complex bugs. Uh, say, for example, in bind, the uh, DNS uh, next record overflow exploited by ADM uh, took advantage of the fact that uh, uh, DNS uses uh, host name compression. So whenever you have a host name, right, uh, in the first uh, and several records in the DNS packet, the uh, uh, names do not repeat. Instead, they back reference. So if you've already seen that substring, you get the back reference in the packet. So when you assemble the name fully, you don't actually know how much space it will take until you traverse all of the um, um, re records backward, all the back references, and then you assemble the name. And then, of course, you need to keep track of the length of all the strings you encounter uh, yeah, this is where a mistake was made in C code, as you would expect. So, uh, very uh, interesting bug, uh, very um, instructive, and of course, uh, a big deal because DNS is your core infrastructure. Then OpenSSH, uh, pre old challenge response. Uh, the exploit was uh, due to Goebbels, and the stream of SSH options in the challenge response uh, was parsed 
And again, if you look at that parser, the parser was carefully written, except uh, the uh, part where variable option lengths, you know, option length, option, option length, option, uh, where all those option lengths had to agree across the entire stream. And if they didn't, then you threw away the packet, the stream. Except by that time, you've already allocated memory. And you've already corrupted memory, and this is how the exploit was done. So another case when a complex format with several integers that must sum up to the end of the packet, and you don't know if they actually summed up until you scan the uh, packet entirely. Again, a subtle bug, a complex format. Very well. Uh, OpenBSD uh, 4.0 and the ICMPv6, a fragmentation attack. So IPv6 uh, headers chain. Uh, if you listen to uh, uh, Fernando's talk uh, yesterday, uh, you have had a taste of that. And uh, those are complicated data structures of variable length, back to back, a whole chain of them. Now, uh, BSD uh, keeps its packets in uh, chained buffers. Uh, again, another chain. And so you have the two chains of uh, variable length structures with pointers, and you had to reshuffle that heap all the time because when you process a header, it had to be contiguous in memory. So it had to be in one chunk. Uh, very interesting, um, a very interesting bug, again, very gracefully exploited uh, due to, again, a complex format and good luck uh, keeping uh, two pointer chains uh, in sync perfectly in C. Um, the common pattern was that, you know, a complex format uh, requires a whole lot of paranoia, right? So up to a certain point in your code, uh, you're totally paranoid, you're checking everything, or you think you're checking everything, or you should be checking everything, uh, and uh, uh, this is called input validation, uh, or we call it recognition. And um, as you remember, our approach to, our recommended approach, uh, language theoretic approach uh, to parsing is that you should actually define the grammar of your valid or expected inputs. So uh, recognition should uh, be um, the, really what you're doing there, um, whether uh, an input fits that grammar. And then of course you have to do work. So there is this boundary, this boundary after which you trust your previous checks you trust that the data is as you recognized, you trust that the input is as expected, and then you can actually relax, uh, hope that those checks will have your back, and uh, you can do malloc, you can do memcopy, uh, you can do arithmetic. In theory, this is how it's supposed to be, right? Uh, first you check can assumptions, then you rely on them. Uh, in reality, this is, this is how it uh, turns out, in most code, right? So first of all, uh, forget recognition or validation. Uh, people tend to describe input checking as sanity checks, as if uh, sanity was some sort of a property that you can check uh, on uh, input. Uh, and well, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, there is also sanitization. Sanitization is an anti-pattern. Do not sanitize input. This presumes that you can somehow recognize uh, badness uh, and uh, remove it, and the rest is okay. And again, this doesn't work. Uh, you, are, uh, you, are, you are going to miss some assumption, and you're going to then uh, rely on it unchecked, and you will uh, fall, and nothing will have your back. And so the more you intersperse those things with um, the uh, things that give power to your attacker, same MCPI or malloc, uh, the power to actually shape your heap or corrupt it, uh, the, the more you will suffer. So there has to be a clear border when you've done uh, uh, validating input uh, and when you can do work and um, when uh, you are still doing it. Uh, but that's not all, because uh, another part of that common pattern is that your uh, 
if your syntax is too complicated, you're almost guaranteed to fail pragmatically. So if you have redundant fields, which must have matching dependent values for the protocol uh, to um, uh, for the protocol payload to be correct, then it's very likely that you will forget one of the checks, and you will rely on one field being uh, agreeing matching in value with the other field, and uh, you will forget to check that, and uh, those fields would be different, and you will suffer. Uh, a clear example of that is when you have nested uh, fields with variable lengths. So you have a containing field and then a field inside it. And uh, they both have lengths and you forget to check that this is the case. That they, uh, that they actually, that the containing length uh, agrees with the contained one. Uh, and then uh, you would uh, perform some memory allocation, and then you would perform some memory copy, and the disagreement between those fields will get you. So values uh, that must agree across layers and objects in the packet, when you have to remember what you had seen on uh, a layer one or two deep than the one you're uh, now operating at in the layers of, across the layers of abstraction, again, this is a recipe for disaster. And all those lead to this thing that, uh, to this pattern that uh, a condition is assumed and not checked. So if you look at the characterization of those formats, then uh, they agree with uh, languages. So uh, the classification of uh, languages the, uh, starts with regular languages those that can be parsed uh, with um, irregular expressions fully, uh, a finite state automaton. Then it goes to context-free languages uh, that can be parsed uh, by push-down automata, stacks. And then it goes to context-sensitive. And already um, a single value, uh, length value, and then the um, variable field of that size uh, gives you weak context sensitivity. Length fields that must agree across uh, many objects give you strong context sensitivity. Uh, it's much better for you and it provides for much simpler parsers to keep your languages context free or regular. So um, if you don't uh, then uh, you are going to be exploited and you're going to have a weird machine in your code and um, essentially context sensitive syntax and uh, ad hoc parsers uh, are guaranteed to provide pwnage. So, you know, we talked about this in 2010, we talked about this in 2012. What's new? Uh, these years are really, they could be called uh, years of the simple bugs uh, or even dumb bugs except that uh, I feel that this is unfair to blame the developers on those bugs because, uh, as you will see, uh, the context sensitivity of those protocols that they were uh, made to um, uh, implement is quite high, and it's really a non-trivial task. So whether the bug is bad or the, whether the bug is dumb or the format is uh, too complicated uh, is an open debate. So what's new? Heartbleed. Right? A very simple parser bug. Go to fail. Right? Uh, a very simple bug in the implementation of protocol state machine. Uh, does it get much simpler? Android master key. Uh, a differential uh, between, uh, in, uh, in between how data is validated and how it's seen when it's, in when it's installed. And Nginx uh, chunked HTTP encoding overflow uh, that has been uh, discovered in Apache uh, 10 years ago. And it took 10 years for this new uh, error uh, to come to light. So these are, the, um, these are the bugs that uh, pretty much dominated the pony scene. And there are many more parser bugs. We'll just talk about those. 
uh, and they all got the ponies, so they're famous bugs with the little stars to their name. So first hard bleed. Uh, let's look at the uh, syntax of SSL records. So here is a uh, heartbeat message. Again, standard SSL uh, syntax. You have a containing record. That record has a length. Uh, that record, um, uh, uh, pointer. Um, that record has a length. And then it contains uh, a sub record, the actual heartbeat message, the payload. And that pay payload has a length as well. So you have two lengths that must agree, right? So that should clue you in uh, that this is where a check will be forgotten. And indeed it was. So despite the overall uh, length uh, being just four bytes, uh, the heartbeat message claimed uh, that the payload was uh, this long. And so the payload that was supposed to be echoed, uh, guess how many bytes of that were echoed? You know, as many as a two byte integer would fit. So uh, that was the essence of the bug. Uh, essentially, two fields that, were, uh, that had to agree, but were never checked. And um, the uh, heartbeat uh, message should have been discarded. Instead, it was processed. And if you look at the code uh, that um, is the parser code, it should have been the parser code uh, for uh, those messages, you will see why, right? So here is a pointer that runs the length of the message and um, uh, looks at the payload, which should have been short, and the check uh, was not done. And then, uh, you know, this is how you mem copy the um, payload back uh, into the response message. So uh, you just go by this length. So you should have discarded this, but you didn't. Uh, now, uh, I ask you, is this a parser? Does this look like a parser to you? Can you guess what data, what data format this code is expecting? what it is uh, expecting to parse? And the answer is no. Well, let's look at the patch, right? So uh, look at the top chunk. The top chunk was the uh, parser, quote, unquote, that was being removed. And again, uh, looking at it, you have no idea what data it expects. And this is the fix, right? The second chunk. Uh, read type and payload length. And you see 1 plus 2 plus 16 one plus two plus, what are those things, right? Uh, can, you, uh, can you guess what format this code is expecting? If you can't guess what this code is expecting, how can you audit this code? Is it so strange uh, that uh, this code was effectively uneditable? So uh, here, uh, the rest of the fix, at least uh, some of those ones and twos are being given some explanation, right? So uh, one is the heartbeat type, uh, length, and uh, uh, the two is the two bytes with a heartbeat length. Okay, so we can sort of work with this. And then uh, the, narrow, uh, the variable, uh, the write length, uh, the amount of memory to copy back into uh, the response uh, also uh, defines the semantics of, of this. But still, you know, uh, so many years from now, who can guarantee that another code uh, just like this with uh, fixed uh, integers uh, is not going to be vulnerable and can be effectively audited? So unless the code makes clear what it expects, uh, good luck auditing it, right? So it's such a simple rule, right? I mean, how hard is it to work, uh, to be careful to work with a shovel? <laughs> it's that the, the um, you know, don't swing your shovel. You can hurt people. Um, simple, simple works, uh, workplace safety rule uh, that was violated in this case. So your input is a language. Treat it as such. Write a grammar spec. 
uh, once you have the grammar spec, make sure that the parser code reads like that grammar spec. And that you can see from the parser code what it is parsing and what it is expecting. Then you can see which ones, which conditions you've checked. Uh, if uh, it's uh, not clear from the uh, code structure, uh, then good luck. You are not going to audit that efficiently. So nested links uh, are syntax. So this is important. When you want to start doing work, and when you want to be not on the paranoid side, when you want to be on the side where you actually do useful work, by that time, you should be done with checking nested links. Nested links are about data boundaries. And you should already have all the data extracted. It's too late to check whether nested links agree when you're already posed to do work. You should have uh, checked them and you should have uh, discarded them in the recognition phase. So they must be checked in the parser. If they don't agree, the message is invalid. This is not semantics, this is syntax. Uh, this is not what the data means. This is uh, even how the data is formatted. Uh, we describe this in the LangSec approach uh, as full recognition before processing. Full syntactic recognition. Do not allow your semantics to happen before you know that the uh, message is valid. And of course, as every internet meme needs a cat, uh, you know, <laughs> this is the this is the uh, LangSec cat. Uh, and if you don't, if you can't uh, paste images into your code, uh, then here is a uh, UTF-8 version of that you can paste in, into your code. Full recognition before processing. Uh, this beautiful, beautiful uh, UTF-8 image uh, was made by Melissa. And if you look at the whiskers on that cat and the ears on that cat and the eyes on that cat, there is nothing ASCII about this. This is uh, Unicode in its full glory, right? So make the cat happy. Uh, uh, do away with your syntax recognition tasks and fully uh, before you start allocating memory and doing other things. Um, Okay, so go to fail. Wasn't that a nice one, right? So um, this is uh, SSL protocol, and this was Apple's implementation, a hand-coded implementation of a state machine. So state machines are good. State machines are a clear model of how you consume input. However, a hand-coded state machine is not so good because, well, state, states are usually circles, right? And transitions are arrows. Fine. And then uh, when you look at this um, uh, wall of code, wall of text, you can sort of see that structure, right? So if one, uh, you make a check uh, and you fail or you proceed. You make a check, you fail or you proceed. You make the check, you fail or you proceed. And uh, by the time you get to like the fourth state, uh, your eyes glaze over, and then you cut and paste that go to fail twice. And then of course, you skip all of the important validation. And this is uh, bad. So this is a state machine done wrong. Uh, you should generate some code. A simple macro uh, would have helped. Uh, not to mention uh, some sort of a uh, uh, code a fr a framework. So, you know, again, a very, very simple rule to observe, right? Uh, don't step on fish as you're loading and unloading your uh, fishing boat. It's easy to remember. It wasn't done. Uh, the results are deplorable. Don't step on fish. So uh, this one was uh, this bug was not on the ponies, uh, but uh, misery loves company. So uh, just not to be you know not to beat up on Apple, uh, GNU TLS about the same time had uh, uh, a similar parser bug, uh, the so-called GNU TLS hello. Uh, you can see uh, the you see the part of the patch. If length is uh, uh, less than session length, then something. Um, 
And then you see that it had to be fixed with another comparison, uh, whether the session uh, ID length was larger than it was supposed to be. Again, this is syntax. This is not semantics. Uh, this should be fully checked uh, as you're checking whether the data is um, as you expect and it is valid. And um, a, a very good uh, description of the actual memory corruption uh, is uh, on the uh, Radar log, uh, the technical analysis of the vulnerability. And uh, just to see what it is about, again, uh, we can look at the uh, proof of concept uh, crash um, that that's here, uh, that was written by Aaron uh, Zoner. So here you can see the uh, stru data structures for uh, the proof of concept being assembled. So you have a type, and you have a version, and you have a length. And then again, this is the uh, containing record. Then you have the uh, uh, a protocol, a payload, again a type, a length, a version, and uh, you know a certain random seed. And then again you have the uh, length and the session data, which is a whole bunch of uh, FFFFFFs, uh, which I skipped. And look at this. This is three uh, data structures. Uh, let me uh, advance the code so that you actually see uh, the resulting data structure, right? You concatenate all of those and you get your packet. And uh, these are nested data structures with the three links and all of those links must agree. What does that tell you? Uh, a mistake will be made and it was made, right? So now, uh, before you can uh, do anything with this uh, message, you have to make sure that all of those uh, uh, length fields agree across uh, all of these data structures. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, GNU TLS didn't get that, that was the bug. So again, a very, very simple, um, a very, very simple uh, a bit of advice uh, that just uh, wasn't followed. So here's another one. If you have two parsers, and they have to parse a message, uh, then very often the security of your system depends on the parsers agreeing. You know, the parsers understanding message the same way. And we've seen this over and over again. Uh, in network intrusion detection, uh, Ptacek and Nushim in 1998 showed that if your IDS assembles the stream of packets differently from your target, then the target will assemble the exploit and uh, the IDS will assemble something different just because TCP IP stacks are full of parsers and those parsers are all slightly different. So network uh, evasion, needs evasion, uh, has been known for quite some time and it's a parser differential. Uh, the term itself was coined in the PKI layer cake uh, when Dan Kaminsky, Lance Esselman, and Meredith Patterson uh, broke the X509 cert system. So they got about 20 different ways in which a CA would see a different common name in the um, cert than the browser that got uh, the signed cert. So the CA was signing uh, something, something, put on something, which happened to contain uh, the uh, substring PayPal, and the uh, browser would see paypal.com. Uh, why is that? X509 is very context sensitive and very ambiguous. It uses ASN1. ASN1 has multiple ways of encoding a string, for God's sake, right? How many of them were there? Five or eight, I don't remember. So uh, making sure that parsers agree in this situation is impossible. And so indeed they did not agree. Uh, if the CA uh, and the browser were using different libraries to parse, the parsers disagreed. That was in 2010. 
Which brings us to the Android uh, master key. Uh, Sorik uh, described that in excellent blog posts. Um, uh, I, I urge you to read all three of them. But uh, the scheme was very simple. Here's your Android package, and uh, you want to verify it. Uh, it's signed. You want to verify the signature. And if the signature passes, uh, passes then you uh, unzip it, uh, uh, then you install it. Right? So simple. And of course, you don't want uh, to write your own uh, uh, cryptography. That would make you a bad person. So you take an existing cryptographic library that happens to be in Java. And then uh, your installer is in C++ because, you know, why would you uh, want to write Java if you can avoid it? You know, writing your own installer doesn't make you a bad person as opposed to writing your own crypto. Um, so, you know, this pipeline, except the packages are zipped and the signature sits in the uh, compressed archive. So the verifier, the Java verifier, uh, unzips it. And so does the C++ installer. And then it turns out that the unzippers do not agree. The uh, Java implementation would extract a different content uh, than uh, the C++ implementation. Isn't that nice? I mean, unzip, if you look at that format, is very context sensitive. And you, know, you sort of expect it. It's uh, a compression format after all. Uh, but, um, you know, in the end, you installed something completely different than what you verified. And the reason for that, um, there, are, there are multiple reasons for that. The best and favorite reason uh, was that C++ has unsigned integers and Java doesn't. So if you had large integers in there, Java's idea of what they were differed from C++ unzippers ideas of what they were. And again, uh, read all three of those brilliant uh, blog posts. They are, they are great. But uh, this was a parser differential, a simple parser bug. So it wasn't fixed right the first time. Uh, initially, uh, you know, patches were offered and, you know, Java was, pa was tweaked and then the C++ was tweaked. And this is wrong. You actually can't do this. Uh, there is a good mathematical reason uh, for uh, not being able to test whether two parsers are equivalent if the language that they parse is more complex than a deterministic context-free. So just to remind you of that standard diagram, uh, regular languages accepted by finite automata, deterministic context-free languages accepted by a stack automata, non-deterministic context-free, and then it goes into um, uh, weakly context-sensitive, context-sensitive, and undecidable. Uh, well, undecidable uh, uh, is bad, you can't, uh, this is your halting problem. You can't, by static analysis, have a general algorithm uh, to determine whether a program uh, completes or not. And in reality, this just means that you have to run it. And by the time you run it, it's, it's too late. So, parser equivalence is only decidable in the shaded region, regular or context-free. And zip is nowhere near regular or context-free. It's strongly context sensitive. So you have, if you depend on the same part, on the same message being parsed the same way, use the same parser. It's just that simple. And in the end, it was fixed that way. Uh, but if this is something that your security depends on, uh, this is how you should do it. And again, this is a very simple rule, like careful with the pitchfork. Pitchforks kill. Right, um, you know those prongs uh, hurt. Okay, so HTTP chunked encoding, a beautiful, beautiful bug. So uh, just to recap, what chunked encoding is: normally, uh, in your HTTP response, you send a content length header. You know, here, here is your web page, uh, and here is how long uh, the stream is. And here's a stream. But sometimes 
when you, you want to start sending a response, but you don't yet know how long it will be. Say you're going through the database, and you don't know, you don't want to uh, uh, interfere with the user experience being snappy. So for that, uh, you uh, can start sending using the so-called chunked encoding, and you indicate in the header uh, that this is the chunked encoding, right? Transfer encoding chunked. And then you uh, give a hexadecimal for the length of the chunk, and then the chunk itself. And then again, a hexadecimal for the length of the next chunk, and then the chunk itself. And when you're done with the chunks, again, you don't know how many chunks will be there, but you know you're done uh, when you send a zero. So simple enough, right? And then uh, the question arises, uh, what if that hexadecimal is not a small hexadecimal, but a rather large hexadecimal, right? So uh, dead beef uh, instead of 19, right? And here is uh, uh, an exploit that, um, here is a part of the Metasploit uh, uh, module for the CVE, which was discovered in 2002. Now that's ancient history, right? Uh, so uh, here, uh, get HTTP, uh, then uh, transfer encoding chunked, then uh, the first, uh, the headers end, and the first chunk starts, and it starts with dead beef. And so can you guess what happens next, right? Um, uh, well, the shell code present in the chunk should sort of alert you to that. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this is the fix. The uh, integer was naturally declared as int, buff size. And so the fix is to correct that uh, at the moment of the comparison and to avoid the uh, buffer overflow and the memory corruption. So you're casting that buff size to unsized int, unsized int uh, to generate the right comparison uh, instruction. Uh, interesting, right? But predictable. So, you know, a simple rule, watch where you're going. Uh, integers are tricky. Uh, just... Um, don't step on them, that sort of thing. And then, over 11 years pass till an exact same issue is found in Nginx, which is a high-profile target. Quite a lot of people have been looking at it. Um, uh, you know, the fix is here. Again, if your length is less than zero, then probably you're doing something wrong. Uh, and you should stop doing that now. Uh, and this is in Nginx HTTP parse. The parser for uh, HTTP headers. So the fix was simple, uh, you know. Um, but why did this uh, vulnerability set, sit there for uh, over 10 years? And the answer is uh, that's the way this um, Nginx is written. So Nginx is a state machine. It actually is a state machine that consumes one character at a time. And this is great. I mean, you can sort of see the, uh, uh, the structure there. You know, you see it uh, oh, bites off a character uh, and uh, interprets this as an integer. And, uh, you know, uh, if it's uh, a digit, then it subtracts uh, a zero. If it's a letter, it subtracts an A and adds 10. And, you know, isn't this great? No, this isn't. Because when this goes on for uh, thousands of lines of code, good luck determining which one of those clauses means what in your input. And, you know, uh, so after... Um, after you, you're done consuming th this character by character, uh, you have no idea from this code, again, what is expected, why it is expected, and how to audit this code. So just to look at some metrics, right? Um, it's uh, 2,300 uh, 20, uh, uh, code lines. It has 57 switch statements. And it has 272 single 
uh, character case clauses. It's a miracle that uh, the programmer could actually keep all of this in his powerful brain, uh, and this works, and uh, this is fast. I and mean, there is a reason why it's fast. Uh, that sort of a state machine can be made very fast. Uh, Rob Graham, in his mass scan, uh, has perfected the art of those fast parsers. But oh my god, how do you audit something like that? The code has absolutely, is absolutely unintelligible, right? Uh, and you're fatigued very fast. Again, there is no idea from the structure of this code, no idea can be derived what this uh, is doing and what is this is checking for. And of course, you know, when you get to line 2043, it's easy to forget uh, to check whether your length uh, is uh, uh, a signed or an unsigned integer uh, that just overflowed. So if you wrote this in the parser combinator style, combining simple parsers instead of writing everything out in, in C, uh, it would have been found immediately. Uh, not uh, sat there uh, for 10 years. So again, a very simple rule. Watch where you're going. Look under your feet if you're carrying a load. Uh, and, and, you know, just don't, don't step where you're going to fall. Anyway, so then uh, I had the slide deck. And then guess what happens? Shell shock, right? So uh, it turns out that the system three, which everyone has been using, which calls your shell, which is usually bash, actually means parse and execute environment strings. Like you thought that you were uh, controlling what the system would call, what the shell would get uh, entirely because you get to supply that uh, string right there and the attacker has absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, and it turns out that there is another invisible argument, and by the way, it is being passed uh, to the shell that it is going to parse it. And so you're thinking that, oh, I'm going to use system. I'm not going to monkey around with exec VE uh, or some such, uh, because, you know, three arguments, are worse than, clearly uh, more complicated than uh, one, and we'll keep it simple. It just turns out that there is another input channel. So it, 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 you, you think uh, that you're invoking this all-powerful genie, the bash shell, right, that can do anything on the machine and can take any program. Uh, it's a fully uh, Turing-complete uh, programming language. So you think that uh, you're you know, invoking this genie and you're whispering, uh, into its ear in a soundproof room, and what can go wrong? Except the genie has the other ear, and it's like pointing outside. And a helpful um, CGI program is exposing that ear to the outside world. So to go Dan Kaminsky, uh, Bash is really a local app that woke up one morning on the um, ship CGI bin uh, with a pounding headache. You know, referring to the uh, old um, uh, practice of uh, hiring, uh, actually kidnapping uh, sailors by getting them drunk, and then uh, the next thing they know, they're not in that port bar, friendly port bar anymore, talking to this friendly guy. They're on the ship, and they, they can get out, and they have to work, uh, you know, uh, for the next uh, so many months while you're crossing the, uh, the sea. So, I posit that uh, there's an important principle that has been violated here. And the principle is that computation power exposed to external inputs is actually computation given away to the attacker. Uh, we call this the least computation power principle. Computational power is privilege, and exposing it at uh, a, com uh, a communication boundary is a very bad idea. So why do you even have your bash somewhere near your inputs? I mean, dynamite, uh, people running around with, uh, uh, with uh, torches, and not a good combination. 
Uh, so, well, gunpowder, anything you like. Uh, so you don't, you don't uh, expose your most powerful computational engine just for the sake of running one program. And everyone has been doing that because no one has been looking at this uh, hidden flow of uh, data uh, through environment strings. If you were made to specify the precise expectations of your uh, input to the system. You will have thought twice uh, rather than saying, oh, and it will accept any string whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, uh, so it goes, and we have shell shock, and that was really embarrassing. So again, watch out for the long pole. Right? A very simple workplace safety rule. If you have a long pole and somebody has to swing it, like stay the hell clear. It's, um, it's uh, a very important uh, rule uh, to observe. <laughs> you know, keep, keep your input away from your computation engines. So, of course, uh, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you if we did not propose a solution. Uh, there is a, a secure parser construction kit uh, called Hammer uh, that Meredith Patterson is working on. And uh, it is uh, in, on GitHub, and you can uh, download it. It is in C. It allows you to write parsers that read like the grammar they are parsing. So parsers that are intelligible and auditable. You can write them in C. And uh, there are bindings uh, for uh, Java, .NET, uh, Python, and other languages. So use Hammer uh, to construct your parser, or emulate the style, at least check the style and see how you can write a parser uh, that looks like the data, the grammar for the data it's parsing. And so uh, I leave you with those parser commandments. Specify your valid and expected input with a grammar. Your input is a language treated as such. Keep, the, keep it as simple as possible. Avoid context sensitivity. Avoid nested field links. Avoid nesting objects unless you actually need it. Uh, and if you do, then keep it context free. Uh, don't make it so that the objects need to agree uh, across, them, across each other. If you handwrite the parser, make sure that the uh, uh, parser code is intelligible and it's clear from the code what kind of inputs it's expecting. Then you will know if you have checked every assumption that you will later rely on. So use the parser combinator style. Um, uh, create simple parsers first, then combine them programmatically. Do not uh, put everything into one large wall of code uh, where you can't see just exactly what you checked and where you are and whether you've checked everything. Don't mix semantic actions with syntax recognition. If some fields must agree, check it now. This is a matter of syntax, not semantics. Do full recognition before processing. And remember that memcopy gives power to the attacker if you fail to check uh, any one of its arguments. Uh, same with allocation. Those can shape your heap. So be very careful with those uh, powerful primitives before the input is fully validated. I mean, the input is already sitting in the buffer. Delay your semantic actions uh, till it's fully uh, checked. And then perhaps uh, you will avoid gaining a pony uh, uh, in the years to come. So we have a workshop uh, dedicated to this. Uh, it happened last year. The papers are online. And there are, uh, I would say, quite a few interesting papers. Uh, Langsec.org uh, uh, has the sub page uh, for the workshop. You will find all of them there. And next year in May, we're going to run it again. So mark your calendars. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is the message that I would like to leave you with. Um, parsers are complex. There is only one way to do it uh, right, that is to say to actually specify the language and uh, to write the parser code so that it is 
uh, reflecting the language. And best, of course, uh, generate the parser code with a trusted generator. Uh, but if you have to handwrite it, then make it auditable and intelligible. Thank you. And join the Langsec conspiracy. Uh, let's make code at communication boundaries, at input boundaries, not suck. <laughs> there we go. Questions? Mm -hmm. um, so JavaScript, right? Um, uh, the question is, uh, it's uh, presumably uh, possible to do uh, uh, proper design uh, and simplify message formats, but what about web browsers? Uh, they include JavaScript programs. And the rendering of HTML uh, is now pretty much also execution. Now, what, what, can, what can we do about that? And uh, yeah. uh, JavaScript, I mean, this really grinds my gears. Like, imagine, uh, this is a language uh, where, you know, so I was taught uh, that in programming languages, people never handwrite parsers. In programming languages, people determine the, uh, uh, people write out the grammar, write the syntax, and they, they have the Bekosnor uh, form, and then they use something like uh, a Bison, uh, Lex and Yak, uh, to generate the parsing code. And, uh, you know, you never would see a handwritten parser, and you never would see a parser bug when the program crashes the interpreter uh, while it's being parsed, right? While it's being loaded. Now, we're not talking about a program running out of memory. No, just program crashing the interpreter code. Guess what happens with JavaScript? Now, this thing is a steaming pile of, of manure, right? How can you build, how can you hope to build anything secure uh, in in the language which uh, you can actually crash with uh, with a program in that language, right? So uh, I'm not talking about uh, the uh, handling of the data values being inconsistent and non-intuitive. I'm not talking about that. Uh, if you uh, if you look. Uh, uh, if you look for this uh, video called WAT, W-A-T, um, it gives you examples of JavaScript syntax and then uh, asks you, well, what does this produce? And you can never guess. It's just that the language was uh, designed uh, in a very ad hoc manner uh, to accommodate a very fast development cycle. But, uh, you know, good luck trusting that. You can't, you know. All you can do is isolate this with layers and layers of isolation. Uh, and even so, it will shape your heap. So, um, uh, so my, I mean, realistically, uh, just do not trust an environment that has to, that, that, that uh, uh, don't, don't build, uh, don't build uh, uh, trusted environments on, uh, 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 that kind of technology. It's uh, uh, engineering, uh, real world engineering, is based on a clear understanding of impossibility, right? There are energy conservation laws. Uh, in the early days of locomotives, uh, people were thinking of how to make the guard on the front of the locomotive uh, in such a way that would uh, you know, not hurt the person who happened to be across the tracks. And there were all sorts of cushioning schemes and sweeps and, you know, 
uh, in the first in the early days of railways, um, cows would get hurt uh, all the time because you know they just roamed free uh, next to the rail line. And then people realized that no, no matter how many cushions you put in front of uh, a train, the energy that ends up in the cow will smash the cow. And uh, you know you can't you can't help this. And so uh, engineering, uh, the reason why houses stand and planes fly is because people understand that certain things are impossible in our world and they work around them. Those people are called engineers. You know, they build engines. Uh, now, if you ask a software developer what is impossible in our software uh, development land, you will not get a clear answer most of the time. Right? There are certain tests that should not be uh, att attempted with improper tools. Um, you know, normally you want your code to be provably correct, and uh, your debugging is the approximation of this process. Now, there are uh, problems where you can't provide the proof, where you can't possibly provide a procedure that would work. Uh, they are called undecidability. Uh, Turing completeness brings the heaviest one of them all, uh, undecidability. You can't, by static analysis, determine any non-trivial property of a program, such as halting, but any non-trivial property at all. So this can't be done. It shouldn't be attempted. Uh, trying to build uh, secure systems on uh, Turing complete uh, languages on, uh, that, that need to take Turing hostile Turing complete inputs uh, is the same as trying to build a perpetual motion machine. Um, and we're now in the stage of uh, early uh, perpetual motion in machine inventors, right? Uh, I, um, I have another slide about that, <laughs> actually. Um, it's just, uh, you know, um, let me, uh, uh, how, how badly am I doing on time? Okay, so I will, uh, I will show you that slide just so. Yeah. Don't review. Okay. So hey. Right? In uh, 1494, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who was uh, um, quite an arms dealer himself, uh, you know, you should read his uh, CV. Uh, where he is uh, writing about his accomplishments uh, and uh, lists all kinds of impressive military tech uh, that he will design if he gets uh, the money um, from the Duke of Milan. Uh, he wrote uh, this in uh, 1494. Uh, o ye seekers after perpetual motion, go and take your place with the alchemists. But we're still in the stage of trying to build uh, impossible systems. And this has to stop. Um, um, you know, uh, there is this expectation of magic uh, from, um, from computing systems. Uh, but uh, just as engineering is um, based on knowledge of impossibilities, uh, so should be software engineering. That was a very long-winded answer. Uh, other questions? So if not, I will conclude with, um, uh, I will conclude with uh, uh, this quote. So uh, Norbert Wiener who coined the word cybernetics, who started the discipline, said one of the chief duties of a mathematician in acting as an advisor to scientists is to discourage them from expecting too much of mathematics. The reason he said that in 1964 was that mathematical modeling, <coughs> mathematical modeling was seen as uh, magic back then. You sprinkle it on uh, any area of human activity, and you get instant improvement. 
and um, he resented that. Now, we see the very same belief in the magic of computers that you can sprinkle them on any area of human activity and get instant improvement. We see it in politics. We see it, uh, you know, we see people claiming that, oh, if we only had more computers, more electronic things in uh, healthcare or power grid or other things, then it would magically improve. And this is just not true. You know, uh, this is the most insightful quote that I've ever seen. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to get. Um, that was a uh, technical report from the Yale University, which is not known as much as it should be. Uh, it said that physics that describes the boundaries of what can be done does not break down at the symbolic level of human activity. Even though it seems that symbolic manipulation that computers do is just so simple and uh, almost free of energy expenditure, it doesn't mean that there are hardness, impossibility results in there. So physics does not suddenly break down at, this, uh, at the symbolic level. You can't uh, build symbolic structures for free no more that you can build material structures for free. And so uh, I would uh, steal this uh, winner's quote uh, and uh, turn it around and say, one of the chief duties of a computer scientist or a hacker is in acting as an advisor to everyone at all is to discourage them from expecting too much uh, from computers until and unless we understand that some things are impossible to do. And we base our computer engineering on a clear understanding of what, what the impossibilities, what the laws of nature are in our field. And I leave you, I leave you with that. Thank you.